someone out there must have wished upon a star because it's time for Magic by Design. If you're an old friend of the show or listening for the first time, thanks so much for stopping by. We are delighted to have you with us for episode 40 of our show. My name is Ken and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Slash Brother Garrett. You just mispronounced my name introducing me. You're not, you're not editing it out. You just mispronounced my name. Sorry. This is the revenge, isn't it, for me interrupting you last week. You're like, I'm not even going to give him a respectful introduction this week. He's If he's going to interrupt me every week, I'm going to give him nothing. I'm going to mispronounce his name. What's guard? Guard? Guard. Give me one moment. My name is Ken, and I... Damn it. Never mind. <laughs> just move on. Just move on. You can't say my name. I'm you don't jo- love me. I- I'm joined by my co-host, Garrett. Gar, I decided to bring you in early this week and it ruined it. Yeah, this is what the, this is what I get for complaining about the podcast format. And then it all goes out the window. You forget how to say my name. Yeah, it's a new script. I, I decided to shake it up this week and it uh, it's not working so far. Ken was so fed up with me jumping in early that he introduced me early and then he forgot my name. Garrett. Guard. 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 <laughs> You're the guard of this podcast. I do call myself Gert in all video games. Yeah. I'm too lazy to type my own name, so I just go for Gert. Anyway, if you are listening for the first time, Magic by Design is a Disney review podcast, and our mission statement is to cover every Disney animated feature film released in cinemas. In each episode, we watch a Disney movie, then we talk about it, and there's even a little song at the end. Most of the time. There's a song this week. There is. There's music in this film, kinda. Kinda. Uh, it's a, there, it's a long story. There's two songs. This week we watched Disney's 40th animated feature, The Emperor's New Groove, which is the third Disney animated film released in the year 2000. Yeah, they're really churning them out. This is like package year churning them out. Tarzan feels like a long time ago. It really does, and Even it's only a year ago. Yeah, it's only a, a year previous to this. And the quality of Tarzan feels a long time ago too. Oh. Ooh, Gary, you're saying that the Renaissance is well and truly over. It, it, I've, I have many things to say about Emperor's New Groove. Not many of them great. <laughs> Ooh, mm. booking the trend, Gary. This is another one of those early run of 2000 films that I've never really seen before, and I have no idea why. It's right up my alley on paper, and it's somewhat of a cult classic. You know, people have embraced it over the years. Many of my friends recommend it, so it, it is a favourite for many. I'm going to upset all your friends who listen by burying Emperor's New Groove. Oof. Maybe not bury Yeah, I'm going to bury it in, in different ways. I mean, it's not up there with the discussion of Disney classics of the Renaissance, but I did think it was different. The, the, I, I think the, the writing of it is interesting, and I think it's worth talking about it. Though this film has a central flaw that it does not overcome would you like to know what that is or would you like to would you like to be that would they like that to be a hook or uh, am i just going to do the usual thing where i jump straight into telling you why i don't like the film you got to reveal it over time you got to improve your dissemination of your takes gary you can't just give it all up front people can just stop listening then yeah just dump the fact that Cusco ruins this entire film up into the front it's fine care what did they just say oh sorry okay talk about why where this film came from sorry ken Cusco bad people will be like, Cusco is meant to be bad, and I will discuss that in depth. Development on The Emperor's New Groove began in 1994, when the film was conceived as a musical epic called Kingdom of the Sun. Following his directorial debut in The Lion King, Roger Allers was tapped to direct the film and recruited English musician Sting to compose several songs for the film. Not to be mistaken with the pro wrestler Sting. No. Who did get the at Sting handle on Twitter, so I think that makes him the official Sting? Yeah, he, do- he doesn't write songs though. Maybe he does. Maybe he's, but it's a hobby. It's he's, it's not a profession if he does write some songs. Yeah. So, what kind of music do you think Sting the Wrestler writes? Quite grim and dark, I'd imagine. I'd say it's probably secretly surfer rock. I think he's still in that zone. So, and, and the rest is just a facade. So, Sting is a wrestler who writes songs as a hobby. And but no, we don't know if he writes songs as a hobby. He could. Music Sting is a songwriter who wrestles as a hobby. Sure. <laughs> Due to the box office returns of Pocahontas and The Hunchback of Notre Dame being lower than expected, Mark Dindo was brought in as co-director to make the film more comedic. Following a series of poor test screenings, creative differences between Dindo and the production falling behind schedule led Allers to quit the film. It became this thing that there was a trend in the kind of mid-90s to the early 2000s where they'd have what they call a bake-off. So if they didn't Not like... Not to be mistaken, with the Great British Bake Off. Yeah. Or if you live in the UK, Great British Baking Show. So or if US they- even. So if they didn't like the direction the film was going, they'd have the team split in two 
and one camp would do one vision, one camp would do another. They liked the, the more comedic tone. So Allers, in fairness, he graciously stepped aside, even though they tore apart his vision for the film. Yeah, there goes our musical epic. Yeah, it would. It was envisioned more like a kind of a, a Pocahontas type. Classic Disney animated fe- feature as opposed to what it became. At this point, Gar, 25% of the film had already been animated with 25 to 30 million already sunk in production costs. To be oh. fair, on like the, 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 the caliber of Disney throwing films out, it being a quarter done is actually quite low. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad, but like they were, I think they were about four years into development at this point. And they were only a quarter done? No wonder, no wonder they were like, maybe we should fix this. The project ultimately, as we said, was retooled as a, a lighthearted comedy instead of a dramatic musical, but they didn't change the release date, so they had a year to put That's this film so together. Disney. It's like, you've been working on this for four years and you're a quarter done. We're going to throw it out, start again, but we're not going to move the release date. The same thing they did with Beauty and the Beast a decade ago at this stage. Apparently, this was due to a licensing deal for Happy Meal Toys with McDonald's that would incur huge fines if they didn't deliver. So they had to get this film out the door so people could get their Cuzco toys and the yeah. Happy Meals? Otherwise Ronald McDonald was coming after Mickey. <laughs> oh god, the only more powerful force than Mickey Mouse in the world is apparently Ronald McDonald. Yeah, we'll get into the troubled production of this film throughout. Uh, I, I sent you an article, Gar. Did you read it? I didn't. Gar? You can, I can react, again, as usual, you can tell me about it and I can react in real time. I planned to read it today but then I forgot. Well, well I'll educate you as usual while you don't listen. And then I will deliver my steaming hot takes, which are some variety of informed and not informed. And there we go. That's the way this podcast works. Yeah, you think you'd be used to it after 40 episodes. You know, I, I'm always hoping you, you will change. <laughs> I'm like, I can change him. Every week it's like, he will be better. It's like, nah, he'll insult me while not being prepared and then bury the film. <laughs> The Emperor's New Groove was released in theatres in December 2000, after it was pushed back from a summer release, replaced by Dinosaur, Joy of Joys. It performed disappointingly at the box office compared to other Disney films released in the 90s, grossing $169.5 million, that's 265.5 in 2021, on a budget of $100 million, that's $151 million in 2021. The film did find much larger success when it was released on home media, though, becoming the number one selling DVD of 2001. Whoa! What, what else was released in 2001? Let me check that. The what? Emperor's New Groove received generally favourable reviews from critics, who praised it as one of the best films released during Disney's post-Renaissance period, but most noting that the comedic tone was its strong point. Um, I would agree that the comedic tone is its strong point. Oh, Shrek, Fast and Furious, Harry Potter. Actually, yeah, it overcoming those films, quite impressive. You know what? Good job, Emperor's New Groove. That was a tough year, and you were the best selling VHS. Uh, but yes, I do agree that the, the, the comedic tone is, I think, the most interesting part of the film. I think the, the, the deepest point of discussion in favor of the film, but I do not agree that the film is good. Interesting. Disney didn't know how to promote this film at the time, hence its underwhelming performance. Do you want to know why? Office. The central character is an asshole. Garrett, please temper your language. No, because then Ken just doesn't want to have to edit the uhs in. And he's like, no, tell you, stop cursing. But like, that's the problem with this film, that Cusco sucks. And people will be like, well, Garrett, the point is that Cusco sucks. Cause he, so he can go on the hero's journey and learn and de- grow and develop. That doesn't happen in this film. And it's interesting that you say that because in the original ending, he just builds Cusco-topia anyway. Which he kind of does anyway, but he just doesn't knock the guy's house down. He just builds it next to him. Yeah. So, like, they had this whole thing of, like, the, the punchline was that he hadn't learned anything. But uh, apparently Sting threatened to quit the film for, like, the fifth time <laughs> and said, this goes against everything that I stand for, my ecological message, my fighting for indigenous rights. So they agreed to change the ending. You know, if they actually went with the lesson that he didn't learn anything, I'd actually prefer the film because he didn't. He goes through this entire film being a self. He's a different because like there are Disney characters that are selfish, but it's like oh they've learned from wrong the wrong people. They're they're looking out for their own self interest instead. Cusco is just a jerk. He's self entitled. He's whiny. He's cruel, which I think is the worst part. He is just flat out cruel with no good reason. He has his kingdom taken away from him and he's turned into a llama because he fires somebody on a whim. And no matter how evil she is, he fires her on a whim. He deserved it. <laughs> so you're saying he put into motion the wheels of his own demise? Yes, thoroughly. And then, well, not only does he not learn his lesson, not only does he not, like, like the big moment he's supposed, is 
when he chooses to help... I can't even remember names of characters in this Pacha. film. Uh, what's his name? Pacha. Well, whose name he didn't even remember anyway, most of the film anyway. Uh, pa- <laughs> like when he chooses the, to help Pacha over the vial. But even then, he still gets his way in the end. That's not even a sacrifice. The, I Like, Cusco is just detestable okay. in every way okay this is basically a film about a bunch of kind people putting up with an egomaniac's bullshit <laughs> and trying to teach him the error of his ways and failing donald trump <laughs> that's clearly that's what all these no we're free again Ken. oh sorry we're free <laughs> is, it, is it a dt free podcast <laughs> yes yeah, so, so like that's this film thoroughly does not work for me because cusco is a jerk allow me to play devil's advocate for a moment so in previous disney films we have this arc where they completely do a 180 yeah. over the course of a 90 minute film like The Beast etc and in fairness that feels earned but w- would it have been realistic for Cusco to completely be a good guy now considering how bad he was at the beginning we can see that he's starting to change but he's no no no, no we don't he still builds his damn house on the side of the hill like that's my problem it's, it's a moderate shack he instead doesn't... of a massive theme park he doesn't change at all like there's the big moment in the film where, where Pachka Apache like walks away away from him and he's supposed to like learn his lesson but Pacha just goes back to him he doesn't even like there's not even like a grand gesture there's not even like a moment where he proves that he is worthy of Pacha's help Pacha is just a kind person enabling an (laughs) asshole and that's what this film is about he deserved to have his empire taken away from him because he brought this on himself so did you like the animation um It's one of those films. We'll talk about it. Uh, where I neither liked or nor disliked that it. it's there. But that's that's why I don't... I think this film sucks. Because he sucks. And again, if the lesson of the film was like, this jerk didn't learn a thing, I'd be like, actually, you know, that's pretty good. This guy's an asshole. And at the end of the film, he's still an asshole. Ken is just melting inside about all the uh-huhs he has to put into this podcast. And that's okay. You tell the listener that he's an incorrigible jerk that can't be helped. And all these people are propping him up. And he's still going to be an incorrigible jerk that can't be helped. But we're supposed to like him by the end of the film, Ken. We're supposed to be like, look at them living together on their hill and be like, oh, buddies. It's like, no, you're still enabling this jerk. I will give you that. I don't like him by the end. I, I think that he, he has more work to do to become a better person. But he is starting to... He's to, the to villain of this film. What? And we're supposed to like him. But it's, it, it's, it's the Emperor's new groove. He's he doesn't not, have he, a new groove. He's like... The, the, the Emperor is like... Moda, he adds like a new move to his old groove. That's what, that's what happens here. It's the Emperor's old groove with Barbie hat. That's that's what this film is. But like I thought the whole gesture of him agreeing not to flatten his house was was the moment. Oh, wonderful, where he still built it next to it. Nice. But he didn't build a big gaudy mansion thing. He yes, just he built did. A, he still bought a, built a house on top of a hill. It's his summer home. It's like a shack. It's still, like a, a modest shack. I just, uh, no. <laughs> okay. He's the worst. He's the worst. David Spade, the most... Uh, it's actually... It's a fi- like, for I, what it is, it's actually a fine film. Yeah, I, I actually think it's the most palatable version of David Spade yeah. I've ever seen. <laughs> but he's still annoying, and he's meant to be. But, like, it's, it's, it's part of the David Spade being annoying that you can't, like, redeem him because he's still David Spade being annoying. The initial plan for this film was similar to the films of the Disney Renaissance with realistic characters and high-fidelity production techniques. Following the ritual of the film, this was dropped in favour of more simple visuals to emphasise the characters. So we do see some of the, the ink and architecture and influences, but they're brought to extremes. Like the hill he lives on is like cartoonishly high. There's no 3D in this film, is there? No. no. Noticeable 3D. No, nothing that's like jumping out at me. They wasted it all on Dinosaur. I think once they decided to go with the more comedic tone and the, they didn't have time really. They had We're just one... going to make a nice little 2D film, which is actually yeah. fine. You talk about the visuals. Like I didn't bump on them either. I don't think they're particularly pleasant but also I don't think they're bad it's just like this is a well-made Disney animated film where you will watch it and not think once about the animation good or bad yeah it's a departure from the impressive visuals of Tarzan the year before we have a more traditional colourful cartoony style less focused on authenticity like Tarzan was the beacon of you know human anatomy moving in a realistic and logical way where this was all squat and stretch one of the things I noted here like the way the characters move like the canyon when they escape the canyon together it makes no sense logically it's just like Ooh. Yeah, and uh, well, you see, that's that's uh, I was 
talking about the writing of this film, Ken, and that's, I think, one of the more interesting parts of this. Like, this is a straight comedy, but it's a different kind of comedy than Disney have ever made, because it's one of those more irreverent, self-referential, like, self-aware meta-comedies. The, the, like, it's a lot more modern in its writing than a lot of, like, the jokes or gags or goofs that Disney, which is usually, like, it's usually just kind of slapstick, isn't it? Like, Disney's brand of comedy in these films. Yeah, but people have said this is more like a Looney Tunes film, even the, even the people who made it. Yeah, so it, it's like, it, it has that self, self-referential irreverent style of comedy which again is completely new to these kind of films it hasn't like none of these co- uh, these are written this way but it has a lot of the things I don't like about that Ken because toward the end of the film there's there's a, a moment where it's like as you were saying where they're getting back to the palace and, and then um, what's it what a Kronk and what's her name get there first and they're like you fell down the thing how would you get there first it's like oh that really makes no sense does it and they move moving on moving on I detest that yeah that, that, i hate it with all of my because like it's like oh look at that it's like no wait a minute you identified a plot hole called attention to it and then didn't fix it that's just bullshit <laughs> that is you slapping the viewer in the face being like ha, 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 we didn't try writing this film it was played for a gag rather than you know actually making sense i don't like it and like it, it happens later i can't remember oh like when kronk bashes the door out and slams like what's the name of that kid what lady person in this film isma there we go Yzma. Yzma, when he slaps her in the face when he opens the escape hatch, it's like, oh, what a coincidence that I would open it right on your face. It's like, nah. yeah. <laughs> because, uh, like, like, and again, maybe that's okay in 2000 when, like, that's relatively fresh and new. But by the time you get to 2021 and people are writing those kind of jokes into scripts, it's like, no, just write it better. I'm sorry. I'm sick of this. Ken is like Ken at least he Ken likes this film and I'm just like here well, being like I have, to, I have to say a lot of people I know like it and I didn't come away loving it like I I, I don't know if I'd watch it again and again but I, mm-hmm. I thought it was an enjoyable 80 minutes and I, I'd say that like it is the writing that makes this film most as I said that I think that's the most interesting point of discussion because it's uh, in terms of comedy it feels the most modern in its writing and its jokes and its joke structure but that's a double-edged sword because some of that modern writing has become really annoying as I said the whole pointing out plot holes and then not fixing them kind of stuff is the kind of stuff that just drives me nuts because that's just laziness and you're calling attention to the laziness and moving on and no you're not allowed to do that that sucks so this film is a long way from where it started you know the the backgrounds are like as you, you the, when you're looking at the characters there's a lot of close-ups behind plain backgrounds mm-hmm. there's some detail but they use that sparingly I'll, I'll move on quickly to the story here kingdom of the sun was to have been a tale of a greedy selfish emperor voiced by david spade who finds a peasant voiced by Owen Wilson, who already did work in this movie and was canned. Uh, to be fair, when you're replaced by John Goodman, who is like the the most heartwarmingly nice person in the history of man, he's when solid. You his voice, yeah, it's just like, come on, you can't go much. Wrong. To be fair, Owen Wilson also has that quality. It's like the, the, the all shucks likableness, so it probably would have worked as Owen Wilson too. But anyway, they look just like each other. Fun. Oh, it's a Prince of Pauper story. Yeah, so oh. it's, it's essentially <laughs> Mark Twain's Prince and the Pauper. All right. Uh, however, the villainous witch Isma, who's who's carried over from the original story plans to summon Supai, the evil god of death and destroy the sun so that she may become young and beautiful forever because she has a lot of wrinkles and the sun gives her wrinkles so she wants to destroy the sun and plunge the world into darkness to prevent her from aging Disco- that's a very self-centered <laughs> it's like i have some wrinkles you could take the sun away so i don't have wrinkles anymore <laughs> so stupid. It doesn't end there, Gary. Discovering the switch between the prince and the peasant, Yzma turns the real emperor into a llama, so it's actually in the original idea for this film, and threatens to reveal the pauper's identity unless he obeys her. During this time as the emperor and doing Yzma's orders, the pauper falls in love with the emperor's soon-to-be fiancé, Nina, who thinks that he is the emperor and that he has changed his ways. Meanwhile, the emperor llama learns humility in his new form and even comes to love the female llama herda. <laughs> oh, oh some sorry. weird bestiality in here. <laughs> no, she's a llama herder name. Oh, herder, right. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I, I messed up again, Gary, but again, you didn't give me a chance sorry. to correct myself. Her name is Mata. That, I'm sorry, there's so no, much No, that's Potter. still bestiality if he's a llama who's falling in love with a llama herder. So there we go. But he's a human, really. But he's currently a llama. So together, the girl and the llama set out to undo the witch's plans. So a lot of the criticism of Aller's version was that it was overstuffed. We had elements of... There's a lot going on there. Of ink and mythology as well and it, it was Which, envis- well, in fairness more ink and mythology would probably make this film more interesting yeah 
And the songs, I've heard a few of them. Yzma has a very good villain song as well in the original version, which was jettisoned. Mm. So like Sting originally wrote something like eight songs, only two were used tangentially, the, the song at the start, which they wanted him to sing. And he was like, oh no, I want someone young and fresh to sing it. Partially because he wanted off the project and he didn't want his name <laughs> on it. And then they're like, fine, we'll get someone young and hip, Tom Jones. There you go. 11 years his senior. If you read the art, the article I sent you, it's by uh, The Vulture, very good. It, it's based on the documentary The Sweatbox and they did some reporting for it. Like this film was meant to be kind of a, a prestige piece, Pocahontas, quite serious, but a little bit of comedy. Kind of like The Lion King. I suppose like, like a mixture between The Lion King and Pocahontas. Mm-hmm. And then a, a mixture of like fretting over the box office receipts and uh, corporate meddling just turned it into this. this. Yeah. Which honestly, based on what you've described, I think this is better than that. Like, like I, one of my bigger problems with this film is something you mentioned about the, uh, including more of like the Incan mythology. It's like, yeah. this film could be said anywhere. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, like it like, could it, just be said Peru anywhere. doesn't pop into my mind at any point. No, it could be about English royalty. It could be set in Egyptian pharaohs. It could be Norse gods. Like, they could have just plopped this film anywhere and it would be the exact same film, which I think is a shame. Like, why set this film like, like, like in that kind of space and then do absolutely nothing with it other than like some of the animation I guess because of the architecture that that's the only way this this film is informed by that like the plot everything else plays out exactly as it would anywhere else if you just lifted it and dropped it into like Irish kings there you go it's the same film I think the better film was somewhere between the two mm. At, like ramping up the comedy but keeping the musical keeping the music is probably the key if, there, if this, this film had more songs I'd probably like it more like there is a direct relationship between the, the like dinosaur and this not having any music in it and me just being like oh because like the music breaks up some of the monotony of like the children's plotting because like it's a children's film so you know exactly what this film is doing and how it's going to play out and there's some decent jokes in there but uh, the, that's where the songs come in it's like and now we go to a musical interlude where we sing a cool song and you get all distracted and you're like do 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 it's like yeah <laughs> Yeah. So there's a kind of dichotomy here. Some people view this as a completely different film, just carrying over some of the characters and themes. Some people see it as a pared down version of the original. But uh, it's, I think it's just a hodgepodge, though, isn't it? Yeah. Like they kept the bits and bobs, they combined them in ways that don't entirely work because, like, again, Isma is completely wronged. Like she yeah. is. <laughs> like that's that's one of the core problems with this film. Like the bad guy is more or less in the right. She does some extreme measures to rectify it, but like she's been completely wronged. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, she has a, a, a legitimate gripe. Yeah, like, this dude's just a jerk. One interesting fun fact here, Gar, despite the phrasing of the title, the film was not related to Hans Christian Andersen's Danish fairy tale, The Emperor's New Clothes. Although both stories involve an emperor being tricked, the film's plot does bear some resemblance to that of The Golden Ass by Lucius Apul... Ap- Apel- Apuleius? Ken put names and scripts just to trap him. Apuleius? Anyway, wherein a man is turned into a donkey. Speaking of Ismagar, where do you find her in the pantheon of Disney villains? I think it's a good performance. Eartha Kitt is great. Apparently she was really able to move on the fly so when they went in to meet her to tell her we're going in a more comedic direction and they were going through some of the dialogue and the storyboards she just started going along with the storyboards like straight away so Mm. they thought she'd be like no I'm a diva I wanted a serious film which is why Sting really wanted off this project he wanted something more prestigious and and Lion King like because he's just like Elton John everyone loves him for that if I do a prestigious film everyone will love me too Phil Collins everyone loves him for Tarzan this is my turn yeah so he found it much less interesting to do something that was like you know more pop culture and uh, it didn't have many references but it's more children's entertainment slapstick Looney Tunes this is the only real analogy I can make it feels like, like a Disney Channel animated movie is that does that feel too cruel to say to, for this film yeah but, but like I, if you think about like like it feels like if they made a Kim Possible movie which I think they did yeah and I'm not sure I've seen it but th- this feels very similar in terms of how it would be written and how it would look to what a Kim Possible movie would look like so you'd receive it much better if you're watching it on the TV. Well, we did. Like, so you we did. We did. We watched it on a, a, a what is this thirty inch screen? I know, but like, if you're not considering this like a, a theater level movie, uh, mm, yes, I think yes is the answer to that. But yeah, I'm just going to stick with yes. Maybe if this was a Disney Channel movie, I'd be like, all right, that's you know, 
harmless fun rather than like the, the canon we're whole like the we're, that's the problem with these films we're comparing it to the lion king because it's in that that's the point of this podcast to track that lineage of those disney animated features so you have to put emperor's new groove in the same conversation as bambi and beauty and the beast and the lion king and it's just not that and it's not trying to be that which i think like the original version of the film would have been trying to be that and this really isn't but it's just not that i mean if they had gone all in on that that's how they could have promoted the film like this is a departure it's a straight comedy mm. but disney felt like that was beneath them that's why i think that's why they were keen to push the film under the carpet yeah and like that and then like what do you market this film as a film where a jerk becomes like just the smallest bit less of a jerk like the tiniest bit less of a jerk that's the hero's journey here like that is that is the story like the, the st- a story of a good man enabling a jerk and helping him become slightly less of a jerk while someone who was rightfully wronged goes to extreme measures to try and right the wrong so what you're saying is Yzma is the real hero of this story or the real protagonist no it's, it's Pacha like Pacha's the hero of the story like I, I know I won't deny that but that's the problem he's enabling a jerk as you said Gary, voiced by John Goodman who is he's good in everything also very it? good yeah, yeah. Good, perf- good performances right. in this even like even David Spade he's playing a jerk he can't help that he didn't write the film he does that well <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, he's really good at improvising as well, David Spade. We'll give him that. You know, like, Cusco is one of those characters. He, he is divisive. People do like him. Why? I don't know. I think people sometimes... We like too many jerks. Yeah. That's our problem. People... If you look at the his state of the world, without mentioning anybody in particular, we like and enable too many jerks. I think maybe we misconstrue it as confidence or that we think that, you know... Truth telling. Yeah, like, or the, the goodness in us goes, well, he can't possibly be that bad. Yeah. You know, because we're transposing our own morals onto them you know he's just a jerk and he's enabled bad people say that Kronk steals the show but after two decades of seeing Patrick Warburton yeah. basically play himself that's the problem like again if we saw this film in 2000 where Patrick Warburton is a relatively fresh voice he was in Seinfeld wasn't he yeah so like he's not super fresh but he's relatively fresh in 2000 he's like a rising star as opposed to like as you said he's done this exact performance in everything he's ever been in since and it's just like yeah I I enjoy it. I think it's pretty good. I think it's one of the better characters in the film, but it is held back by the the, the what came next for the rest of Patrick, Patrick Warburton's career. Yeah, he has some excellent one-liners and gags, though, and the double act of Yzma and Kronk is probably the strongest part of the movie. Yeah, there should be an Yzma and Kronk film, if I'm honest. There is a... a you know a, what? Yeah. I'm rewriting this film on the fly, where instead of Cusco being the protagonist... Yzma should just be the protagonist of this film, right? This should be a film about Yzma and Kronk trying to right the actual wrong of them being kicked out by this arrogant, egomaniac, cruel man. And that it, should be this film. It would have been an early example of upending the villain trope yeah. where the villain is actually, you know, traditionally she would have been a villain. But as we said, we can both agree that she is right yeah. to be upset and she's right to be seeking restitution yeah she's booted out of her castle and her role for uh, um, i think that she might have like overstepped her job at some stage it's like doing too much ruling but he's not doing it yeah. like if anything he's she he's she's like g- being kicked out for like covering the holes that he's leaving behind by being bad at his job that's even worse so like yeah the yzma and kronk should just be the straight good guys in this film uh and then you can be like you know Gru from despicable me where she has this lair and she has all these poisons and that fun stuff like yeah yeah i've rewritten this that's what this film should be basically what they wanted it to be was a buddy road comedy with pacha and cusco and their double act did you know they do some funny stuff with cusco posing as pacha's wife so he can enter a diner because there's no llamas allowed there's some fun comedy around that but like i find myself when i think about this film gravitating towards the pairing of isma and gronk more yeah so there we go fix the film disney should have hired me in 2000 fair enough i would have been eight and probably not able to rewrite this film but disney you should have hired me in 2000 where does pacha fit in your new film though that's the problem um maybe he joins forces with yzma because like because he's gonna have his thing built and he wants to help dethrone the 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 cruel horrible dictator who's gonna crush his entire town so they team up so it's a three-person film so they try to take him on a misdirect so he's like oh i'll take you back to the castle but he's actually trying to keep him away from the castle yeah but then the question is why doesn't he just kill him or something no i don't think you do the llama bit i think you leave that out he's just a horrible man living in his empire and these people are trying to take him down i think he has to be a 
stronger character in that case, not like a measly kind no, of... No, I think it's, it works that he's a measly kind of sniveling jerk. It's like a Robin Hood with the prince g- g- guy whose name I never remember, who's also just a sniveling weasel. And I think that character really works there. And I think it would work here if these people came together to try and topple this absolute douche. Okay, we, we touched on the music. Uh, Nicole will go into it in more detail. They kept a couple of Sting songs in this movie, despite them being written for the more serious version of the movie. So they don't really fit at all. He originally wrote eight songs, which were completely linked to the original story and characters, and most of them had to be cut from the film. But yes, they insisted on keeping him on board. I think they wanted him uh, as a... Do you know why? What happened with one of those songs? He got nominated for an Oscar. That's probably why they wanted to keep him on board. <laughs> so, like, they're like, Sting song, Disney film, award bait, keep him. <laughs> and in fairness, they did push all of his songs on the soundtrack. So you can listen to what this film might have sounded like. Yeah. But like, when you listen to, there's a song called Do the Llama Llama. There's a song where Isma raises a bunch of mummies and dances with them and talks about her villainous plan. That sounds like fun. Exactly. This film, I, I like the fact that it's leaned more into comedy. And I, I don't just think, keep the songs. That's yeah. what they needed to do. They just needed to keep the songs. Because I think when Disney have tried to go serious, like with The Hunchback of Notre Dame and with Pocahontas, it's some of their most iffy stuff because they can't really land it while trying to maintain their commercial interests. Yeah, but even then, they still had like Colors of the Wind, which is an all-time great Disney. So like, even if you're like, oh, I don't really love Pocahontas, which I don't, I'm still like, oh, Pocus of the, uh, Pocus of the Wind. Uh, Colors of the Pocus Wind. Pocus of the Wind. <laughs> <character>. <laughs> yes. Colors of the Wind is just a phenomenal song. So at least, you know, that film has some redeeming quality because they kept the music in it. So like, thinking over it, I, I I really do think that this film needed to be somewhere between what it was and what it became because we, I think for me a Disney film needs those songs I think it needed a little bit a uh, touch more of seriousness but I did really like the comedy because like I'm a comedy guy I like comedy I, I gravitate towards comedy when I watch things more often than not which is why I parked Bridgerton and started watching Superstore instead oh, Superstore is so good right. it's, it's not even so good that's the thing about Superstore it's just like it's really comforting yeah and I think like network sitcoms have become so like just bad and nothing going on that like superstore which if a show was released in 2009 in a year like the office and parks and rec and community and these big comedies everyone likes and big bang theory which people like for reasons it, it, it would have been like a really lower tier comedy in that era but now that like everything else on network tv sucks you get like the goldbergs and you get like superstore which i reckon like they're like really solid middle of the road comedies which is like ah oh, i will watch it all until the end of time well we were this is not a superstore podcast yeah, we're now uh, veering into to different territory altogether about uh, comedy writing but that uh, legitimately that is one of the more interesting thing about uh, about the emperor's empire emperor's not empire's new groove emperor's new groove is, is that the comedy writing is is a lot more modern than it has been in a lot of these disney films written by the same person who wrote finding nemo yeah he was nominated for an oscar for finding nemo but he originally wrote for conan o'brien yeah so it, it was very much kind of a late night comedy room that wrote it yeah and i think that's why disney bristled against it because they pop culture references stuff like yeah. that which actually not, not a ton make it into the film but it ha- it still has that like pop yeah. culture references fe- it's weird it, yeah. that it's like there they, aren't actually many pop culture references in the film especially compared to like hercules which has tons of them apparently david spade when he was improvising threw in a load of stuff about michael jackson etc and, and politicians of the day like clinton and they told him to, to so what is this is an animaniacs get out of here yeah, rain it back because they wanted it to be more timeless and yeah. i don't think they succeeded in that because as you said it still has that feel of being poppy yeah uh, uh, but again uh, as I said it, it, it feels like a DreamWorks film maybe that's what I'm getting at here it does kind of feel like a DreamWorks film well at the time they were losing ground to DreamWorks so I think because Shrek Shrek came out the same year so. this was a, a time when animated films were shifting that way to be a bit more commercial a bit more cynical as yeah. uh, as you've often referenced in the past brainless I would have said and well, Shrek is great so I won't throw I won't throw out the yeah. Shrek Disney simultaneously embraced that but also that's not what pulled we back from it yeah so they're like in this weird middle ground where it's like that's what's successful now Academy Award for Best Animated Feature started this year based on these films and they lost it to Shrek which yeah. must that must have been such a knife in the, the the heart of Disney to be like for the first they've released every animated classic for at this stage 60 years and then finally there's an award at the Oscars to recognise Best Animated Feature and they lose it to DreamWorks that must have been like devastating for them I guarantee like the the day that happened they're like how how 
So I think this film is a good case in point for what a great comedic animated film can be. Mm -hmm. But it needed, you know, we've criticized Disney for a formula in the past, especially in the last few episodes as we went through the Renaissance. But it did need a sprinkle of that formula. And it needed, like, because what's the message of this film? Don't be a jerk or be less of a jerk. Enable jerks. Is it be less of a jerk? But not, but still kind of a jerk. I don't. The thing I think is like I think that they tried to go for a moral there, but they sacrificed that for the gags. Yeah. So like, which is like, is fine. Yeah. But then what? What's this film? You know, then this film then loses all the. Emo- it has no real emotional heart. It has no real narrative heart. It doesn't leave you with anything interesting thematically, and all that's left is the jokes because there's no music either, and the animation is solid. Yeah. Where if it had the jokes, it had a little bit of that Disney narrative structure and storytelling, and it had the songs. I think, as I said, the original vision was too much. There's a middle ground there somewhere. Yeah, and I think that film was the film I wanted to see. I I, I think I would watch this film again because I did enjoy the comedy, especially Gronk, even though as we said, Patrick Warburton, maybe uh, if we watch this in 2000, we appreciate it more, but we've seen him do his shtick. Yeah. Like, uh, and he's, he went from being like an actor who did things to like playing himself yeah, literally and everything. Like, like he has a, an extraordinarily distinctive voice. Yeah. So he does his Patrick Warburton voice in everything. It's just yeah. fine, but uh, tiresome. Yeah, as I said, uh, I will remake this film for you, Disney. If you're ever doing a live action remake, hit me up so I can make the version of this film that works. Uh, other than that, I think this film has too many problems. That's my problem. As I said, the most interesting thing is the writing of the comedy, and the rest of the film has way, 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 way too many problems. In fairness, for a film that was rescued from the... Beauty and the Beast was cancelled halfway through, rebuilt from the ground up, and it's one of the best films they ever made. Made in about a year. Don't you tell me that this mediocre film was said that was salvaged in a year is pretty good for what it was. They did Beauty and the Beast in a year, Ken. I do think it's better than the sum of its parts. They, they extracted something of some value from it. Yeah, people love this film, so they're going to be really mad at me. There's actually quite a lot about the legacy of this film. A documentary called The Sweatbox details the production troubles that the Emperor's new crew endured during its six years of development. It's never been released. Disney are said to have buried the doc because it shows the studio in a negative light. The creators are still keen to get the film released. Wait, it's never been released? No, Disney own it, so they've shelved it. Not even, like, slyly put it in a Google Drive somewhere for people to Uh, see? In July 2020, the film was uploaded to YouTube and has been over the years but the Disney lawyers quickly get it taken but, but it's out there if you want to find it yeah. uh, I haven't been able to find it no, I, I could probably find it I'm better at that than you. I mean I'm very bad at pirating things please don't sue me a direct to video sequel called Kronk's New Groove was released in 2005 and an anime hit spin-off called The Emperor's New School aired on the Disney Channel between 2006 and 2008 and it won an Emmy I've never seen it. No, me and neither. Th- again, that's during an era in which, like, I would have watched Kim Possible and Recess and all of those shows. That were- and Fillmore. Fillmore doesn't get enough love. Fillmore was a good show. Yeah, Fillmore is like a, a thinking man's cartoon. And I don't think it's on Disney Plus, which is actually quite upset. Maybe it's they put it on there since. Maybe it's too mature. Maybe it'll come with Star. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's been a campaign to get it on there, but it hasn't succeeded yet. Why isn't it on there? I don't know. Maybe it was too adult. I, I, I don't really remember much of what happened other than Fillmore. I was going to... It was like a noir detective show. Yeah. I don't think it was like edgy. And Philip Moore was like a, an adult in a kid's body, which I liked. Yeah. After the release date was shifted to winter 2000, similarities were noted between the film and DreamWorks animations The Road to El Dorado. Jeffrey Katzenberg had been at Disney while The Kingdom of the Sun was in production. So he ripped it off and brought it to DreamWorks. Yeah. It said that, <laughs> uh, it speculated that uh, The Road to El Dorado was based on what Katzenberg had seen at Disney's. The whole time that he's pushing DreamWorks forward, like it's all based on the fact that he was jilted by Disney and so, then like they make Shrek which is like I get it's based on fairy tales so that's the, the, the closest thing you can tie to things at Disney but like Shrek is something very un-Disney and it was their biggest hit so maybe what they should have learned there Ken is they should be trying to do their own thing instead of trying to do what Disney do yeah because if you look at Spirit and you look at The Prince of Egypt they're all in the Disney mold especially the, those 90s prestige Disney films yeah. which I don't think I've actually seen either of them so I can't I can't comment <laughs> but uh, he's coming after Disney hard at this time and he's he's playing dirty gear well stealing their ideas yeah as we said the the emperor's new groove is seen as a departure from the broadway style musical epics of the disney renaissance to a trend of more comedic slapstick style films in the mode of shrek and ice age this could be seen as a kind of a watershed moment where disney 
lost its way for a while. I don't think the next few films are like that, though, are they? Yeah. Because uh, I've seen Atlantis. I don't remember much about it. But I don't think it's like... No, Treasure Planet. I've seen Treasure Planet. But I don't think it's that kind of film. Like, Lilo yeah. and Stitch and Brother Bear aren't. Then we have Home on the Range, which is which, uh, 100% I think, that film. I think they get toward that film more in, like, the mid-2000s. I think there's still, like, it, the battle between commercial cash-ins and artistic integrity is kind of waging in Disney at the moment. I think they probably would have got there sooner other than these films were already in production. So, oh, so yeah, like a lot of these ideas. But, like, Lilo and Stitch is... I think conceptually one of those films yeah. but emotionally it isn't yeah because they put that good old Disney heart in there yeah so we'll see so like, so this film is notable in that Disney tried something different with it not by choice but by necessity mm-hmm. and I think that they found something valuable jokes they, yeah but they like they gave up everything else in the process yeah and films today do have comedy but on Disney's terms it's never edgy or groundbreaking and it is funny like like I find Moana a very funny film mm-hmm. uh, but it, I would like that kind of comedic bite to films but like again you're moving in an adult direction so maybe that's not what they want and to it's do. all that like kind of Marvel MCU comedy which is just like quips yeah that's 90% of comedy in Disney films yeah where this is this was aiming for something a bit more like again it's not highfalutin it's not like uh, it's not these like wonderfully constructed jokes that, that that build and build on each other they're just like one liners but yeah but it was weird and I like weird it is quite weird again and it veers into the ways it can be weird and which I don't like where it's like plot holes oh isn't that funny <laughs> Trampoline salesman. I know, I, like that kind of stuff. I, I think the trampoline salesman I'm okay with. It's yeah. the, 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 like, just like, there's a plot hole here. We're going to draw attention to it and be like, haha, isn't that funny? I'm like, no, it's not. So, Gar, just to sum it up, would you recommend people watch it? I think I still would. I think people would like it more than I do. If you can get over just how just thoroughly awful Cusco is and the fact that that makes the entire film an irredeemable mess, I think you can enjoy it more than I did, but. I went into this film excited because I felt like I was going to really love it with the comedy and the characters. And I, again, I do love Yzma and Kronk. I do really love John Goodman as Pacha. And I think that David Spade serves his role. But like, I was excited to watch this film because everyone's like, it's a cult classic. It's a hidden gem. People love it. And I remember when the c- credits roll, I sat there with that sort of empty feeling I had with other films that I wasn't so fond of in the Disney canon, such as the package films and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. So I don't know if I'd be returning to it year after year, but I I probably watch the best bits on the internet. Like, I think the best... The best, like, hidden surprise in the Disney Disney pantheon is The Great Mouse Detective. Like, that's the... Oh, that's actually surprisingly good! (laughs) You know, film. That's the bar for surprisingly good, and this doesn't come near it. Again, like, I I have too many problems with this film. I'm sorry. Sorry, people who love Emperor's New Groove. Maybe you'll like Kronk's New Groove when we get to review that. Maybe I will when we eventually run out of things to review. And when Disney commissioned me to make their live action version of Emperor's New Groove and I fix it all. Or make it worse. Probably make it worse. But go on. All right, Disney dictators. We've nearly come to the end of the show for another week. Resident musical expert Nicole is coming up in but a moment with a song from this week's movie. It's the highlight of the show every week, so be sure to stick around for that after our closing spiel. New episodes of Magic by Design drop every Monday, where all magical podcasts are downloaded. Stop by our website at magicbydesign.buzzbout.com to find a full list of podcast platforms. We are literally everywhere. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon, you name it, we're on it. We've been doing this quite a while now, so stop by the website to find the entire back catalog if you're catching up. Or 40 you... episodes, Ken. Yeah, 40, 40. 40 weeks in a row. That's so many episodes. All of the Disney films, all the ones you love, like Tarzan and Hercules and Beauty and the Beast and Aristocats, unfortunately, and The Black Cauldron, which we covered, even though it's fine and they don't want us to. I just realized I misspelled emperors there, which now I'm learning I didn't know how to spell emperors. I mix up the O and the E. I go for emperors instead of emperors, so. Yeah, Garrett writes down all the stuff he watches on a board. Yeah, I keep track of everything I watch over a year because it's kind of fun to be like, what did I watch? We are also active on all your favorite social media platforms. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash magic by design pod on twitter at magic design pod and on the insta at magic by design pod so you're a fan of the show you want all your friends to know about it and you're asking yourself what can i do well don't worry we are here to guide you through the process out of the goodness of our hearts very nice of you if you want to support the show please do consider giving us a review on your podcast platform of choice five stars please you can share the podcast on your socials or recommend the show to a fellow disney fan if you give us a five-star review we will adopt a llama in your name and send you monthly updates on their progress 
if you don't, the llamas will die. Oh. So, is the llama Cusco? No. Because then I'm kind of okay with that. One of them dying. is named Cusco. The others are named Pacha. But it's, it's not actual Cusco. No. So, okay, because I'd be okay with that llama dying. He's a jerk. We will be back next week at the same time, same place, with a review of Disney's 41st animated feature, Atlantis The Lost Empire. But until then, stay safe and remember, life is all about pulling the correct lever. Now then, Nicole is here with her own version of Walk the Llama, a song written for Empire of the Sun that was eventually cut from the Emperor's New Groove due to not fitting with the new movie's story. It's in the soundtrack, so it counts. Yep, it's absolutely there. And, as we said, the songs in the movie are a bit mad, so we are going to treat you to this catchy forgotten bop. Yeah, I I haven't heard it, so I don't even know what it sounds like. Thanks for listening. Now, over to you, Nicole. Hello there, Disney fans. It's me, your musical correspondent, Nicole, coming to you live from my bedroom. This week we're finding our groove with The Emperor's New Groove. The movie was one of the first after 1999's Tarzan that was not a traditional musical but featured minor songs. Sting and musician Dave Hartley were hired to compose the songs as a musical feature, but as the plot changed, many of the compositions were cut. But were included in the soundtrack. The film features vocal performances by Tom Jones, Sean Colvin, Eartha Kitt, Rascal Flatts and of course Sting. The score was composed by award-winning composer John Devney, known for his compositions for Hocus Pocus, The Passion of the Christ, Chicken Little, Spy Kids, The Princess Diaries. He has written for a lot of different genres of film. Interestingly, Sting's wife created a documentary called The Sweatbox, which documents the painful transformation of what was called The Kingdom of the Sun into The Emperor's New Groove. The movie changed from a tale of greed to the comedy we know today. It is said Sting was not impressed. The song Funny Friend of Me was nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Original Song, but lost out to Things Have Changed from Wonder Boys. This week, I decided we need a good groove and something more up-tempo. So here's my version of Walk the Llama Llama. I hope you enjoy it. Walk the Llama Llama, walk the Llama Llama, walk the Llama Llama, walk the how, bow. Thank you.